that particular hymn asks a very important question, doesn't it? And I want you to keep that question on your mind throughout the entirety of the sermon. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Now, how you answer that question determines where you will spend eternity. It's that important of a question. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Centuries ago, while one of those large cathedrals was being built over in, in Europe, a spire was being placed atop that large cathedral. And one of those who, were, who was engaged in the construction of that building fell from the top of the cathedral to what was surely to be his death. But to everybody's amazement, the man did not die. And the reason he did not die is because just at the right time, there was a flock of sheep that were passing right beside that cathedral that was under construction. And when the man fell, he fell right down on top of the back of one of the sheep. Now, while that was a hard fall, that sheep softened, cushioned the fall, and the man lived to tell the story. But the sheep did not live. You see, that, that man fell on top of the sheep and crushed the sheep. Because that happened, there was placed upon top of that spire, made out of precious metal, a little lamb, sheep, just as a reminder of how that construction worker had his life saved because of that sheep. And yet for those of us who are Christians, we understand the significance of that, don't we? We understand the symbolism there because there is one in our Bibles who is identified as the Lamb of God. And he was sacrificed for you and me. He gave his life for us. And so the title of the message this morning is The Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. God has always associated salvation with the Lamb. And throughout the scriptures we read about Lamb, a Lamb that was sacrificed unto God, as God commanded His people under the old economy. We have studied the New Testament and read about the true Lamb of God, which is God's Son, Jesus Christ. And so in biblical typology, that little Lamb, the little Lamb that God created, represents the Son of God, who's also identified as the Lamb of God. Now, in the Old Testament, there seems to be a prevailing question, and that question is, where is the Lamb? Where is the Lamb? Look at Genesis chapter 22 as one of our first texts this morning, and you remember that Abraham has been told to go to the top of Mount Moriah, and there he's to offer a sacrifice unto God. But the sacrifice is to be none other than his son Isaac. But Abraham has always learned to trust God. He's always learned to be obedient unto God. And even though his heart must be aching, we know that he was willing to fulfill the command given to him by God. So in Genesis 22, Abraham and Isaac together go to the top of Moriah, leaving everyone else behind. And really what we see here is a picture of Calvary because it is similar to God the Father and Christ the Son uh, trotting up Mount Calvary where Jesus would be sacrificed. But here we have Abraham and Isaac. They are on their way to the top of Mount Moriah where Isaac is to be offered. But Isaac doesn't know this. Now keep in mind that Isaac, uh, though a young man, is still a man. And he asks a very important question to his father. Abraham is, uh, is obviously uh, very distraught and no doubt Isaac can see the stress that his father's carrying. And so he asks a question in verse 7 of Genesis 22. My father, 
And Abraham says, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? That's really a question that's posed for the entirety of the Old Testament. There is continual reference being made to a lamb that is to be offered. But the question is, where is this, is this lamb? And Isaac asked the question, I see the wood, I see the fire, where is the lamb? Listen to Abraham's response in verse 8. Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Now, perhaps you don't see uh, in that particular verse what Abraham is saying. And maybe Isaac didn't understand exactly what Abraham <laughs> was saying. But in reality, God is going to provide himself as a lamb. All right? God will ultimately provide himself as a lamb to be offered. But Isaac perhaps knows that something is not right in his mind about this picture. There is the wood, there's the fire, there is no animal for sacrifice. Where is the lamb? God will provide himself a lamb. I don't know, maybe Isaac begins to understand. Something unusual is taking place here, but all I know is this. When they get to the place where the offering, where the offering is to be uh, presented before the Lord... Isaac will willingly lay down his life at the command of his father. And thus, in Genesis 22, we see an Old Testament Calvary, or as some have said, a dress rehearsal for Calvary. Isaac is willing to lay down his life, his life, because his father commanded him to do so, just as another would later lay down his life in submission to his father's will. Now, we know what happened in Genesis 22. Remember, Abraham passed the test that God had given him. And as he raises his hand to slay his son, who has been commanded to do this by God, the angel says, no, you don't have to do this. <laughs> You've proven yourself. God knows that you're willing to always obey him, even to this point to sacrifice your son. And so the, the one who was bound on that altar, Isaac, was allowed to go free. And caught over in the thicket was a ram. And the ram was then offered and placed upon the, was placed upon that altar so the lamb could be offered, the ram could be offered unto God. Now, something died that day, but it wasn't Isaac. And what was offered was a substitute or, for, or something in, in Isaac's place. It's interesting to me that later on our Lord Jesus Christ would say to his enemies, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it, John 8, 56. He saw it. The question might then be asked, when did Abraham see Jesus' day? I believe it was when Abraham was on Mount Moriah when he was about to offer, offer Isaac. And yet Isaac was not killed, but the ram caught in the thicket became the substitute on that occasion. And so it is that Abraham and Isaac could look down the stream of time and see another substitute. They would see Jesus the Christ who would be placed on a cross and his life would be offered in their stead. The continual association of a lamb with God's salvation. We see it in Exodus chapter 12. God has promised to bring the children of Israel out of, out of Egyptian bondage. But before that happens, ten plagues come upon Egypt. And the last, the most fearsome, because on that particular night, what's called Passover night, the angel of death would pass through and all the firstborn of Egypt would die. Only one spared were those who had followed the command of God and had blood of, an, of, a, of a lamb placed on the doorpost. And so in Exodus chapter 12, beginning in verse 3, notice Moses says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Now Moses is to reveal this on behalf of God. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. 
Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Now, what happened on this night was a meal was prepared, and likewise the angel of death would pass through Egypt but would pass over these homes wherein you would find God's own chosen people being housed. The firstborn in those homes would not die because the blood was on the doorpost and the angel of death would pass over. We understand that. So here again we have, we have the picture of a, of a lamb being slain for the protection of mankind, for the salvation of God's people. And so in Exodus chapter 12 we have that Passover meal, something that was to be celebrated by the descendants of those who were enslaved in Egypt. In fact, the night of his betrayal, Jesus was with his disciples in an upper room partaking of the Passover meal. But put this passage down, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, it is Christ who is our Passover. You see, what happened in Egypt on that dark night pointed those who gathered toward another time when God's lamb would be slain and Christ Jesus would become our Passover. And because Christ Jesus died for us, death does not have to come upon us. He took our place. The question in the Old Testament, where is the lamb? Isaac posed the question. There on Mount Moriah, Abraham and Isaac got a glimpse of something special that was to come. A substitute will die in our place. On that dark and dreadful night when the angel of death passed through Egypt, those who listened to Moses, who listened to God, had their doorpost covered with the blood of a sheep. And as a result... The death angel passed over and they could get a glimpse of God's lamb who is to come, who would die for them. The prophets wrote about this. In Isaiah 53, we have pictured the suffering servant of God, one who according to verse 3 of that chapter is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, one acquainted with grief, we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. And surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And then all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. We know that's talking about Jesus, who would ultimately become what? The Lamb of God. Now, back in the spring, some of us had the opportunity of visiting Shaker Village, and on this particular day, some sheep were being shorn. Beta was traveling with our group, and she and I went down to the barn to witness the shearing of the sheep. Now, I can tell you, some of those sheep that were being shorn were not so quiet, were not so docile. But this lamb, the text says, is dumb before his shearers. He opens not his mouth. It is an Old Testament picture of Christ Jesus who is to come. That's why Isaiah 53 is called the zenith of messianic prophecy. For there we see the Lamb of God who will give himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. Throughout the Old Testament, where is this Lamb? The Lamb of is on his way. And all these different pictures available throughout the Old Testament pointed toward God's Lamb that is to come. We come to the gospel accounts. 
And now the question, where is the lamb, is finally answered. John 1, verse 29. John the baptizer says this of Jesus, Behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. The Old Testament, where is the lamb? Where is he? We hear about him. We sacrificed all these many sheep. All of these animals have been nothing but a sacrifice reminding us of our sin. But we keep hearing about the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Where is He? And John answers the question, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He's talking about Jesus, God's Lamb. Fast forward a few years. And you have Jesus in a place called Gethsemane. And there in Gethsemane, he is pouring out his heart. This is the Lord Jesus pouring out his heart unto God. And he says, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. That is the suffering that he was about to endure and the sorrow that was attached to it. If there be some other way, let this cup pass. And yet there was no other way, for it had always been determined by God himself that Jesus must die this death, for God would provide himself a sacrifice. And here is God about to provide himself a sacrifice. He would die. And Jesus knew that. And Jesus doesn't slip out the back gate of Gethsemane, but rather he allows himself to be arrested. He didn't go the way of the cross kicking and screaming. For John 10, 17, he says, No man takes my life, I lay it down. Just like a humble sheep. Just like a little lamb. And then he's led from that garden where he prayed to one mock trial after another, where all kinds of false accusations are made against him, where ignorant men and hateful men spit in his face without the realization that they were spitting in the face of God. They would take their hands and smack him and with their fists beat him to a pulp. They would lacerate his back with a scourge and then mock him by placing a robe around him. Bowing down, they would sarcastically refer to him as the king of the Jews and then strip him of that robe placing a crown of thorns upon his head. They pressed that crown of thorns upon his fevered brow. And what would hurt you and me likewise hurt the Lamb of God? And then Jesus would stand before a mad throng and one who could have helped him, Governor Pilate, would ask, Who do I release? Barabbas? a murderer, or Jesus the Christ. And they cried out, Release Barabbas, a thief and a murderer. My, how Pilate underestimated that audience. And it was Barabbas who walked away free, while the one who was innocent, the Lamb of God, stayed and suffered. And on that occasion, as Barabbas walks away, hold hands with him because, you see, we're walking away as well. We're being allowed to walk on out the gates of the city free as well. And the one who is innocent, the one who knew no wrong, he would stay as the substitute and suffer the punishment that was meant for you and for me. And then the lamb is led on to, to Calvary, not even complaining, not lashing out, 
at those who will crucify him. He will humbly lay down his life as a sheep would lay down his life. Crucified between two thieves. And there suspended between heaven and earth hangs your Savior and mine, the Lamb of God. What did John say? Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. That's his mission. And there on that cross, when you see him in your mind, behold him. Look upon him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes your sins away. That's him. Where is the Lamb? Isaac asked. Where is the Lamb? Is the question all throughout the Old Testament. But John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb. Look to Jesus and you'll see Him. Look at the cross of Calvary and see Him hanging on the cross. Behold the Lamb and watch what He's doing. Through His shed blood, He's taking away the sins of the world. And then that reminds me of Hebrews chapter 10 and how that death of Jesus satisfied the wrath of the Almighty and how His one sacrifice is enough. For in verse 10 of Hebrews 10, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That is, only one time did Jesus have to die to assure our salvation. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. All those sacrifices from the Old Testament that were continually offered were offered because God commanded it. And yet it all pointed to the sacrifice of God's Lamb, Jesus Christ. For these sacrifices, he says, verse 11, cannot take away sins. But this man, that's Jesus, this man after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. That's the Lamb of God who died for you and me. Revelation 13, 8, He was slain from the foundation of the world. You see, never a time when God did not know how He could redeem lost humanity. And thus Jesus was slain even from the foundation of the world. Where is the Lamb? That's the question of the Old Testament. You get to the gospel accounts. Behold the Lamb. Then what becomes the message after the gospels? From Acts to the book of Revelation until the end of time throughout the remainder of eternity. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Where is the Lamb? Behold the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Why is this Lamb so worthy? Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Notice verses 18 and 19. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. What became, what became the heart of every gospel message that was preached from Pentecost onward? You know what it was. It was the message of the Lamb of God, wasn't it? The Lamb of God. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is His message. Worthy is the Lamb of worship and adoration and praise and service. Worthy is the Lamb. That became the, the theme of the apostles' preaching. And notice how Peter continues in 1 Peter 2, verse 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self by our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins 
should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes, he says, ye were healed, the Lamb of God. You get to the book of Revelation, and you see that heaven itself and all creation should join together as a, as a chorus with voices singing together, worthy is the Lamb. Revelation 5, beginning in verse 11, notice. John says, I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Whatever's under consideration here, it is an innumerable host that's gathered, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. What I take from that particular passage is this, Worthy is the Lamb of God, and let all that hath breath give him glory and honor. Who's in heaven? It's Jesus. And what is the theme of heaven? Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. That's the theme of heaven. That's our theme while we live right here on this earth. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy of our praise and our adoration. Worthy of our, of our service and devotion. We're the whole realm of nature mind that were present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Precious Lamb of glory, God's most wondrous story. Heart of God's redemption of man, worship the Lamb of glory. Where is the Lamb? That was the question long ago. That was answered when Jesus came. Behold the Lamb. And once we behold the Lamb, what becomes the theme throughout eternity? Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Jesus died on Calvary's cross as a Lamb without spot and without blemish. His sacrifice was sufficient. His sacrifice enough to cleanse you of all your sins, to cleanse me of all my sins. Not only to cleanse us from our sins, but to put us once more in a proper relationship with God and to keep us justified throughout all eternity. Have you trusted in the blood of the Lamb? Have you come to, to Jesus to receive the cleansing blood of the Lamb? You can this very morning. You can. That blood that flowed from Calvary's cross is still available and it's still flowing and it still cleanses and washes away sins. There's still power in that blood. The New Testament teaches us that when one is baptized into Christ, he receives the cleansing efficacy of the blood of Jesus. And from that point onward, the blood of Jesus will flow and keep the child of God cleansed from his sin. That's the only way. That's the only way that one can be reconciled unto God is through the blood of the Lamb. The only way that one can, can be restored to a proper relationship with God is through the blood of the Lamb. The only way that one can receive eternal life comes through the blood of of the Lamb. And so during this invitation hymn, keep that in mind. 
the only means of human redemption is the Lamb of God. Song we sing so very familiar, just as I am. I come to whom? To the Lamb. O Lamb of God, I come. Come to him. Even now, let's stand and sing.